Hi, I'm Brad Sobolewski, and this section of our board review is focused on trauma. Let's start with wounds and lacerations. Remember, dilution is the solution to pollution. Wounds should be aggressively cleaned and irrigated. Let and Lido with Epi can generally be applied safely to digital structures, like fingers, toes, ears, and even lips. Puncture wound through a shoe? Cover for Pseudomonas, even though staph is the most common bacteria. You gotta know burns for the boards. This is a picture of a sunburn. We've all had one. Superficial burns were previously known as first degree. They are limited to the epidermis. They are red. They blanch with pressure. They are dry with minor swelling and pain and usually resolve in five to seven days. Partial thickness burns are previously known as second degree and they're divided into two subcategories. Superficial partial thickness include the papillary dermis and are blistering, pink, moist, and painful. They typically heal in two to three weeks without scarring. Deep partial thickness burns involve the reticular dermis. They are blistering, red and or white with poor blanching and capillary refill. They typically are very painful with very sens variable sensitation to light touch. They can take three to nine weeks to heal and can scar. Full thickness burns are previously known as third degree burns. These involve the entire epidermis and dermis. They are dry, leathery, waxy, and painless. They require skin grafting unless they're small. And when they're fully circumferential, these full thickness burns can form a strangulating eschar that causes ischemia distally to tissues. Fourth degree burns involve the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and underlying structures, including fascia, muscle, and bone. Total body surface area is superficial partial thickness and above. Younger than 14, each palm is 1% total body surface area. The rule of nines can be used in patients older than 14. Head and neck is nine, each upper limb 9%. The thorax and abdomen, both front and back, are 18% each. The perineum, don't forget that, it's 1%, and each lower limb is 18%. For minor superficial burns, analgesia alone. For partial thickness burns, bacitracin and adaptic dressings twice daily. For major burn care, ABCs, do not over resuscitate. Intubate for inhalation injuries. So these are singed nasal hairs or singed facial hairs, carbonaceous sputum, hoarseness. The Parkland formula can be used to estimate fluids, and it's appeared on tests in the past, so you should probably know it. Electrical burns are not commonly seen in the ED, but they often show up on tests. Household AC current, which is 110 to 240 volts, only causes local burns. You don't need an EKG, you don't need labs. Now, burns to the oral commissure from biting an electrical cord are concerning. The labial artery at the corner of the lips can be injured and bleed profusely once the eschar begins to separate, and this is one to three weeks after the injury. So these should be seen by a plastic surgeon. High voltage burns, so power lines, 500 to 1,000 volts can cause asystole, V-fib, and rhabdo. Ocular burns, well, alkali cause liquefactive necrosis and are generally more dangerous than acidic burns, which are more superficial. You should irrigate until the pH is neutral. Consult ophthalmology. So in submersion injury, you either drown or you don't. So the term near drowning has been phased out. The sequence of events that happens in human beings is initially water enters the mouth and nose and the patient spits it out. The conscious response to hold one's breath can last about 60 seconds. Eventually, that inspiratory drive becomes overpowering and water is aspirated into the airways, which leads to reflexive laryngospasm. Hypoxia of the brain terminates this laryngospasm response and patients eventually become apneic. This can happen in as short as five minutes or even sooner. Tachycardia leads to bradycardia, which leads to PEA and ultimately asystole. Hypothermia is only protective if the patient becomes hypothermic at the time of submersion and if rapid cooling occurs in water under 5 degrees Celsius. So the patient fell through ice into the water during winter in which the temperature has been below freezing for several days. Poor prognosis of submersion injuries associated with submersion greater than 5 minutes, lack of early basic life support, and development of ARDS. The overall survival rate for submersion injury is approximately one-third, but many serious injuries have a poor prognosis overall. Fresh and salt water submersion are managed exactly the same. ABCs, O2, and chest x-ray for symptomatic patients. You can safely observe children for four to six hours, and if they're asymptomatic, discharge them home.
All right, let's move on to head injuries. Know how to calculate the GCS. That's gonna show up on a test. Know the management of concussions and return to play guidelines. Know what a subdural and epidural hematoma look like and what to do about them, called neurosurgery. And know the signs of skull fracture, like raccoon eyes, hemotympanum, the PCAR and low risk criteria for clinically important traumatic brain injury have been known to show up on tests. So pause this slide if you'd like and know that the criteria for children under two differ from those older than two years of age. Blunt abdominal trauma is much more common than penetrating abdominal trauma in children. So what's the most commonly injured organ? The spleen. Intestinal injuries present with delayed symptoms, so 24 to 36 hours later. This is because a hematoma develops inside the lumen of the intestine and causes pain and symptoms of obstruction such as vomiting. In the hemodynamically unstable patient, you know, those receiving a transfusion of greater than 40 ml per kilo of crystalloid or receiving packed red blood cells, and in those with a positive FAST, these patients require laparoscopic surgical management. FAST, the Sonogram and trauma is not as helpful in the stable pediatric patient with blunt belly trauma in contrast to adults since kids need to go to the OR much less frequently than grown-ups. Stable patients with abdominal tenderness or bruising are preferably imaged with a contrast CT of the abdomen and pelvis. A chest x-ray should always be obtained in patients with blunt belly trauma to rule out pneumothorax, hemothorax, major vessel injury like a widened mediastinum, and pulmonary contusions. Stable patients with mild to moderate pain can be assessed with laboratory studies such as AST, ALT, lipase, CBC, and urinalysis. If these are normal, this can help you rule out intraabdominal injury in a patient whose pain improves and can tolerate oral intake. Fractures are gonna show up on the PEDS board, so you're gonna to have to know the Salter-Harris classification. Salter-Harris II is the most common. There's a lot of specific testable fractures. They include green stick, torus, spiral, clavicle, and supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Here's a picture of the Salter-Harris classification. Here's a picture of a torus fracture. This next one, it's a green stick. And finally, this is a spiral fracture of the tibia. Compartment syndrome is actually rarely seen in children. It's most common with tibial and supracondylar humerus fractures. The five P's that you've heard of in the past are actually unreliable. The pain, pallor, paresthesias, pulselessness, and paralysis. The clue is pain out of proportion to the fracture, especially pain remote to the fracture site. Ankle sprains will show up on the boards and in basically every shift to work. The Ottawa ankle and low risk rules have found to be nearly 100% sensitive in detecting clinically significant fractures in both kids and adults. Children with acute ankle injury who cannot bear weight for more than four steps or who have tenderness over the distal posterior six centimeters of either malleolus should get x-rays of the ankle.